says still 629. So uh, it should flip here any second and we'll get started. That went. You're ready. All right, they <laughs> did. All right, I see that uh, we have a quorum. And so I will call the meeting of the city council, city of Hillsborough to order. Uh, first item on our agenda is approval of consent agenda. We have two items under consent agenda. First is vouchers totaling $672,438.91. Did everyone receive copies of the vouchers? Mm -hmm. Any questions regarding those vouchers? Hearing, uh, okay, then we'll move on. I, I gotta get used to this. I will at some point. Uh, and there we also have minutes for the 9-6-2022 regular meeting. Did everyone receive copies of the minutes? Any questions, corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, I'd accept a uh, motion to accept and approve the uh, consent agenda as submitted. I'll make that motion. Councilman By moves. Is there a second? second. Councilman Lowen seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And now we move into our first public comment. And we have two members of the public here to address the council. And that is Roger oh, and Skip Fleming. <laughs> and uh, what we'd like you to do, if you wouldn't mind, is come up and use the podium, please. Okay. The first purpose of our attending is to talk about ordinance number 1243 relating to the sewage disposal, disposal system charges. The current ordinance says a month, monthly base rate is $31.68, the volume rate $398 per 1,000 gallons from four months period from December through March. These rates may have been adjusted. The copy that we received was signed January 21st, 2014. The ordinance reads a monthly service charge for the use of services rendered by the sewage disposal system shall be paid to the city for all persons, firms, corporations, and any organization within or without the city having a sewer system of the city. The ordinance further reads, the amount of water used for billing purposes shall be determined by an average of water used per month during a four month period from December through March. Two questions to us that raise. It says water used. It does not say water bill. Currently, the meeting reading is taken at mid-November through mid-February. And if you look at that sheet I gave you, a little awkward. There's one that's currently how it's being read. And the next one underneath that is the one that we feel is accurate. If you look over in the, the second column, the service from service two, Currently, the service is being figured, the usage is being figured from October 12th through February 14th. And in my estimation, that's not really mid-November through mid-February. I am, and the reason we're here, we do a lot of water. And the purpose of this ordinance is that the, the water used determines your sewage. And I appreciate the fact that the council sees fit that we don't pay water or sewer rate on everything used because it's not going down our sewer. So that's why, if you look back at that current one, you look over at usage, October to November, we used 19,900 gallons of water in last year. And it went on to 11,482 and 4474. The 4474 and the 3067 is much more standard for what we use that actually runs through the sewer. The other amount does not. And my understanding is that's why this ordinance was passed, that we would not be paying for water that has not gone or for sewage for water that did not go through the sewer. And that's why we're saying. We'd like to see, I don't really know that the ordinance needs to be changed, but the method of 
picking that up and billing it, I think needs to be changed. That it truly starts in December. And you can argue, okay, should it start December 13th through February or April 11th? Or should you back it up one month and do November 17th through April or through March 14th? And I know those months, the actual date sometimes varies depending on the year. <clears throat> but this year, when we got hit with a $70 a month sewer bill, instead of what we feel would be maybe in the 40s, that's quite a difference. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many other people are anal, like I am, sorry to say that, that actually look at their bill. I think a lot of people look at the dollar amount, and that's what they pay, and they don't question where is this coming from. We're not trying to get out of paying our fair share. We want to pay for sewage what we run through the sewer. We're not trying to skip that. Um, but we also want the city to be fair to us and calculate it for the time we feel it should be calculated. Um, like I said, the ordinance reads water used, not water billed. The way it's currently being done to me is water billed. I do have a current copy of that ordinance if anybody would like to look at it. I also have copies of our bills. I also, we talked to, you've got good people here at the city. Appreciate that. Um, we ask, what's not the most current one? I have my papers mixed up again. Like I had asked. Uh, <laughs> I had asked Karen, or I guess actually Matt asked Karen, to give me a counting of where it was billed. If you look at this, this is actually the usage, the read date, and the amount agrees to these dates here, uh -huh. which to me is not November through. Yeah, because that's actually starting in October through right. February. Right. So that is why we're here. Okay. Just wanting fairness. Just, just perspective, for my part. We lived in Carriage Hills, which we had it. We irrigated our yard from a well, which wells are good on the west side of town. They're not so good on the east side of town. So I've elected not to drill a well because of the expense and. Hills Brand B said they've had to shut theirs down to irrigate their yard. So in the 15 years we lived in Carriage Hills for the two months, I never once heard Cynthia question the city bill. We moved to Prairie Point in 2020. Everything was fine. Spring of 2020, 21, Cindy asked me, why is our sewer bill $50? So, well, the rate must have go up. So I just kind of discounted it. Then the following year, why is our sewer bill seventy dollars? I said that's a problem, and that's that's why we are here because we we don't complain, but there's something wrong with because we knew we were going to use more water. That's not that's not the issue. Mm -hmm. So. That's my point. And if you, if you go back on, on the sheet I gave you, and I didn't make it, if you go back till to November, I'll actually be the October billing, and I didn't put the, it would start with the, okay, it would be be this, um, the one that says service two would be November, and that starts in October, and that would go down through, and that was, you know, it did jump up in that time too. Mm -hmm. Although the higher months, because we, this last year we put in a new lawn after our construction, and that's why we were watering heavily. But we're also doing, we like to keep our yard. Sure. Nice. We reseeded yesterday. Mm -hmm. And you cannot get a yard established for winter time in one month, <laughs> two months, maybe. Last year I asked Michael to not turn our sprinkler off to the last one on his list, and that was right around Christmas time. So we were watering pretty heavily to get ready for a dry winter, mm -hmm. getting our yard so it has subsurface moisture. And so we watered heavily until the middle of December. Yeah, a few months, I just, that's so that's, 
Which I very that's much where we're at. And I don't know how many other people do this, but uh, we, we're proud of what we have because Prairie Point is a highly traveled street in Hillsboro with the church, the uh, daycare, and the elementary school. So. But we thank you for your consideration. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your preparation. Thank you. And, uh, all the information you got together to share with us. Appreciate it. We will let you go on unless you have more questions from us. Yes, yeah, so are there any questions? I mean, I think it would benefit if you stayed till we were done oh, talking that? about this issue. Yeah, or, yeah, or, I, I didn't know what you were going to do. Didn't know Matt, I think you have some yeah, information we you prepared. Pulled it all out and they kind of talked about this and uh, yeah, so it, the way things have been done, and I can't determine how long ago that has been, uh, has been that, you know, they use the billing from December, January, uh, February, March to bills. figure those, to the bills, right? Yeah. And that that is true that they don't match up with the, the usage in there. So um, I think we could, we could just administratively change that, um, but I think it's good that we get some direction from you guys as far as what you want to see. Um, you know, if you wanted, it, you were thinking, if you thought about doing December usage, you'd probably go and, and use the bills from January, February, March, um, and April. You don't necessarily need to use four months. You could always reduce it to three. It just kind of depends on how you want to do it. But the way the, the billing does get read in the middle half of the month, we issue the bills for the first and they're due in the 15th. So it's kind of a, it's always going to be kind of an odd cycle because of the way we read meters. So, um, you know, I think a fair would be to use the January bill and because yeah. that captures December. So if we, the, did, if we did that, we wouldn't have to change the ordinance. Yeah, we wouldn't necessarily have to change the ordinance. We just want some direction on that. We'd just be administrative on that. Right. If you yeah. went to three months, you'd have to change the ordinance. Right. You'd have to change the ordinance. Or if you wanted to change the months you were going to use, okay. You'd have to change the ordinance. So um, some people put in spring loans too. So we're trying to think of when that when that starts as well. Well, the truth is the watering season has as winter has gotten shorter, the watering season has gotten longer. So, so I don't know if there's a for, for information in the in the fall, I don't turn my sprinkler off because the ground is still warm and I can sprinkle late in the spring. I look at the calendar on the last freezing date before I turn my sprinklers on. Okay. So when I irrigate, I don't have to worry about my sprinkler system because the ground is cold and it will freeze up faster. That's my thought process. Whether it's right or wrong, that's what I do. That's what you do, yeah. 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 And then you say that's what everybody does. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Some people water all the way through. I've seen people okay. running their sprinklers in December and January for yeah. some reason. Yeah. yeah. Strange. Well, it seemed to the simplest would be just to change the administrative mm -hmm. side yeah. here. Yeah. And that would really fall in line with what you guys are suggesting. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you use a January bill, that means we that need to be. stop watering in November 15th. Right. Yeah. If you want to if you want to avoid that, get it on there. Yeah. I know. And <laughs> I'll probably be watering after that. Well, at least maybe it wouldn't be as well, much. At least it's maybe. one month. Yeah, I mean you, your top. Your top month here was nineteen thousand, almost twenty thousand gallons, and uh, you know that time period from middle of October to the middle of November. So yeah, then it went down. Just say it went down. It went down. Well, eleven thousand. That's that's still a pretty, pretty healthy drop. Um, still so, but it's still seven thousand seven thousand over more than kind of what. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. that's yeah. It's just thoughts to consider. Yeah. And I know it'll, to it'll affect your income, but uh, trying to figure out how that. Well, if you're worried about April, you could. I mean, I don't want to take the change of ordinance, but you go to three months instead of four. You can go to six months. Go to the middle of June. I don't care <laughs> because that's our lowest month. So, just just for the sake of conversation. I mean, it, it seems to me like the dates, if, if, if we're truly trying to capture water, household water usage, right, mm -hmm. then uh, we, should, uh, we should avoid 
completely any any chance of months that people are actually watering, watering their lawns. Right. And so to me, that would be changing it. And, and I would think it should match the seasons. I mean, we have four seasons, four quarters, three months sounds reasonable to me. And also, you know, it should be matching up. I, I don't care when the meter is read. I mean, it should match up to usage for the months of December, January, and February. Mm -hmm. That's just my opinion. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. That's, that's yeah, well, just one guy's if, opinion. If you went with the, the January bill, you would still have a portion of November in there, but that would capture all of December too. So, well, or you could slide it another, or you could cut a month so, off. That would be so. So, I guess I just I just We're need you, we just need you to tell us yeah what what read dates are we talking about to capture yeah actual December January and February water usage. Well, you you're never going to capture just that whole month because of the way we do it. So, well, what's the best opportunity to do it? Yeah, I mean. If, it just depends on how important you feel like that first half of December is because it's always going to be captured on that other bill. Well, I would say if, as long as you've captured the second half of December the second and then three months rolling from there. So you'd go, you'd go December 13th through, through March 14th. Yeah, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. that one. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that very much. That That would be fair winter months. To those spring waters, right? Yeah, you don't want to set. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's why we drop it to three. So you, you don't plant potatoes, potatoes till St. Patrick's Day anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. So in order to do that, we would have to do an ordinance change. Um, so then we'd be taking the bills from it'd be the February bill, the March bill, and the April bill, and then we would be recomputing. Um, sewer averages for the May bill. Right now we do it in, in April. That's not a huge deal. So. Okay, so is that the direction the council would like to provide to staff so that they can prepare that for our next meeting? Yeah. I think it'd be the most fair. Okay. Yeah. Will that work yep. for you guys? You feel like that's that's a reasonable accommodation. It's probably yeah. more fair than that. Before, that's the I fairest I can come up with in my mind. Mm -hmm. The actual winter months. Well, but but if the goal of the thing, like I said from the beginning, mm -hmm. was to try to take out the extraneous or mm -hmm. extra water usage, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That that we right. know isn't going down the sewer system, then uh, then yeah, I mean to mm -hmm. me this is. Mm -hmm. So tweaking it in, making it, making it, you know, adjusting, making an adjustment. And if that creates a problem for our sewer costs, then we're, we're better off just leaving it that way and then raising the fee. I mean, mm -hmm. right. At some point, if that's how it, if works, that's out. How it works out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think that's the most fair. Because it's not fair to just have it on the backs of people that are watering their lawns. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that if we have to adjust rates, that that's fair for everybody, not just Right. Putting it on your back or whoever else might be watering as well. But. I have a feeling we're not the only one. I have no way of knowing who mm -hmm. has a well and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. well, that's right. Or who waters. Well, I can try to tell you who waters and who doesn't. I does, do have one, one more Sorry. question, and it's regarding the minimum. So if you're hooked to the sewer system, the minimum is there. Any water that goes in into it is on top of that. Correct. And again, just as a as a statement, and Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the problems that we are dealing with with KDHE on our sewer system is a lot of water or rainwater, surface water intrusion into the sewer system. So it is, you know, it is an issue that we're dealing with for other reasons, for sure. But uh, but yeah, we're trying to keep it out of the sewer, you know, keep, and we do, we do know that there's still houses where people have their, have their uh, guttering system dumping into the sewer. So there's some pump. Yeah, there's some pumps and so forth. So anyway, thank you guys. We appreciate you well, coming. And thanks for now. consideration. And uh, hopefully something can be done in everybody that, waters you know in the fall and spring benefit so
great. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving along in our agenda, um, we do have a, another um, a public comment that, that I received that I'd like to read into the record, but I think I'm gonna save that for our second public comment section, a little closer to uh, council comments, if that's okay. Um, so we will move on now to a public hearing for 114 South Birch. Mr. Stiles. So we uh, originally talked about this back in the end of July um, and set this public hearing for this time, uh, giving them, giving the homeowner uh, ample opportunity to make corrections to it. Um, so you've, you've got Doug Dick's report on this. This is sort of his uh, initial report and I had him go back out and look at it uh, Friday and there was no change on Friday. So issue there, uh, structurally unfit for human occupation, exterior structures in disrepair, lack of maintenance, um, dangerous structure on the premises, exterior walls, show damage, deterioration, neglect, eaves are bad, um, you know, tears in the structure allowing wildlife to get in, the foundation is damaged, structure is basically abandoned, and I think that's has been confirmed by neighbors that it really the only thing that happens there is it gets mowed. Um, there's been no no change in this, and so like the previous ones that we've had, you've got a resolution 22 uh, 2022-11 that will give the homeowner 45 days to respond to this. Uh, we did contact well, we we attempted to contact the homeowner. There is a, a caretaker essentially. Uh, for this person uh, that one of the homeowners I believe is deceased and one is in a, a care facility. Uh, we do have a local person who sort of takes care of that. And uh, we talked to, I talked to her directly about it. Um, I don't, it obviously didn't change the situation I and mean, there's been no improvement, but uh, so we did make you know, legitimate attempts to, to contact that homeowner. Uh, and we will provide, you know, the, this ordinance would provide 45 days. We have to also provide uh, direct direct mail to them. And then it gets published in the newspaper as well. So it'll be you know, our normal opportunities to, to have this conversation. Um, and then, you know, if after that 45 day period, there's nothing there, we would have the option to remediate the property and then charge it back as a tax lien. So I would say that this property is, it's not, it's in bad shape uh, for sure. Um, Somebody probably could remediate this facility if they wanted to spend the money. Um, I couldn't tell you how much that would be or if that would even be worth it from a cost benefit analysis, but uh, it is in the middle. It's a, it's a two story house. It's a fairly large lot. Um, you know, there could be an opportunity there for that too. I don't know, but um, as it is now, this is kind of the option we have in front of us. Okay. Is there any public comment regarding uh, this property at 114 South Birch? Um, I guess I guess maybe I should add those those comments I got because they did pertain, or at least the part that pertains to uh, to this property. And uh, if you'll excuse me, I have to uh, pull up an email. So uh, David Zeller, who's a neighbor of, of the property, uh, reached out and said, uh, said the following, Lou, I see that you have on the agenda to, for tomorrow's meeting, the property of 114 South Birch. I'm a neighbor to the north of the property and only have seen some mow the property. A few times someone has went into the house to retrieve a few items. It's a sad thing to let a house like this just go. I would like to see this house get some new life in it as it would be a great house for either a growing family or another rental house with the right people anyway. If it wasn't for the current workload at work, I would like to attend the meeting, but at this time I am unable to make the meeting. Has there been any discussion with the property owner slash owners as to possibly selling the house to someone willing to rehab the house? So on that, uh, I guess I would direct that question to you, Mr. Stiles. Yeah, there didn't there didn't appear to be any intention to sell it at this time. 
and uh, so would it uh, would it make sense to advise the uh, the caretaker or the person that's uh, helping these these folks that there might be an interest in somebody purchasing the property? You can absolutely do that. That's no problem. Uh, but of course, it'll be kind of unofficial because they are not. I understand. I mean, uh, right. I get that. But uh, at least explore, and maybe we could uh, we could. Uh, uh, advise at some point whether that's an option or not. Um, all right, that's uh, that's that for now. And uh, is there any other questions or comments regarding this matter? So even though you're going to do that, you would still recommend that we pass the resolution. Yeah, I think that. <laughs> I mean. It, Obviously, it doesn't. It still right. gives the person forty-five days, and you know, it, it just enables us to take action. Should we need to, but we're not required. Right. Any other questions? Hearing none, I would uh, accept a motion that we adopt resolution twenty twenty-two dash eleven, giving the homeowner forty-five days to repair the structure and authorizing the city to proceed with remediating the property after that period and authorize the mayor to sign. So moved. Councilman Driggers moves. Is there a second? Second. Councilman By seconds. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll poll the council. Councilman Driggers? Yes. Councilman Lowen? Yes. Councilman By. Yes. Resolution 2022-11 is hereby adopted. The mayor will sign. And that concludes our public hearing for 114 South Birch. We will now move to a department head annual report and we have Kara Duell uh, here to report on the Family Aquatic Center. Welcome, Kara. Thanks. Come on up to the podium, please. <laughs> this was not how I anticipated presenting this, but the copier is not working. Well, there you go. So, Karma. as my education professor, you know, made me realize I'd have to be flexible. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and I'm still super nervous standing up in front of him. <laughs> I just always feel like I'm going to be graded. <laughs> and you probably need to change the size. Oh, let me, let me do the screen share portion of the program. I think it sits at 176 percent. I don't know why I can't make my computer fix that. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you go to the second page, I have the hours that we had this summer. We have lap swim from 6 to 8 and 5 to 6 p.m. We had toddler time, which was widely used this summer. Adult time, which y'all have a floaty, like a raft. You need to show up from 12 to 1 or 1 to 2. It's very popular. Everyone's floating around on their rafts. Very comfy. Uh, open swim, 1 to 5, and then 6 to 8. Saturdays, 1 to 7, and Sundays, 2 to 7. Red Cross lessons started at the end of the swim team season. Becky Yoder taught those. We had water aerobics on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Aaliyah Ettinger taught those. Uh, private lessons available from the staff. I had 17 lifeguards that taught swim lessons this summer. Once school starts, obviously I have to scale back hours because I don't have staff, but we were able to keep the six to eight and the five to six. Toddler time, 11 to one. We use the 11 to one toddler time for the homeschool families that do PE. Uh, teacher time, and I actually had a teacher request at the end of the uh, end of the month, beginning of September, that if it was going to be over 90 degrees, I keep the pool open for the teachers. I was kind of like, yeah, you know what, I'm pretty much burnt, and I'm getting in trouble for my overtime, so no. Uh, Friday, and then the Monday through Friday, the first week of school, from 12 to 3, we had the elementary students come for PE. That was 269 students. Hillsboro Middle High School PE was Monday through Friday, the second week of schools, and it varies time-wise depending on what time the class is scheduled, but it's sixth grade through freshmen and had 179 students. Highlights, 31 staff, 
489 members. We averaged 120 people per day. And Matt did the math, and I can't remember what it was. Approximately 12,000. 12,000 total. Yeah, total. total. Now, obviously, repeats, but some people come every day. Right. <laughs> we were open for 95 days. I was only closed once for a not weather situation and that had to do with the water department. We only had four weather partial closings, one full day closure for weather. And that was the first of the swim meets we tried to host and it got rained out after warm up. Several of you are kind of know what happened with that. We had 22 different rentals. We provided activities for Prairie View preschool and school age groups. They come in separate from being open to the public just because some of those kids have some significant anxiety and different issues. Uh, Tabor Camp came in again, 100 plus swimmer, two different groups, two days. We hosted the Welcome Back Junior High Party for the, high, the middle school, uh, provided swimming for elementary and middle high school. We host the big MB youth group opener. We had eight weeks of swim team with 85 swimmers aged from five to 18. We hosted welcome back party for Tabor College men's and women's soccer. We also continued the lunch program where they go and get the school lunch based on income this year, which was different from last year. Uh, but we averaged nine swimmers per day for that. City of Tampa, shows up and does a party, and I'm reasonably certain that the entire city of Tampa shows up, <laughs> even if they don't get wet. <laughs> and I looked that up today, 105 people live in Tampa, and I think we had 87 of them in the water that day, and a numerous amount on the deck. So I think literally the entire city of Tampa, which I don't know if you call it by people's city, but literally in our water, and uh, our pool heater, AKA the dragon died. And we call it the dragon because it's so corroded that when you light it up, it actually shoots flames out two feet. Uh, so as far as that goes with the heating system, I'm looking into two options for heating the water and we're still having a lot of conflict as far as how this will work out. One would be replacing the gas heater with another gas heater, and I'm working with Pools Plus in Hutchinson, and I've actually talked with Fleming. They came out and inspected it with uh, Matt and Doug and I there. It looks like they're telling us about 23000 to replace that, and that's on top of the gas usage. We only run this thing like three weeks a year. So I'm kind of looking into some solar power. I'm working with Hotspot Energy out of Chesapeake, Virginia, because there's no place in Kansas that does this. Matt, I was on the phone with King Solar the last two days, and yeah. they can't even give me a contact. There you go. Okay. Fair enough. Um, it looks like potentially, based on their system, it would be about $20,000 to run a, a rooftop system for solar heating which obviously there's no gas involved. It can last longer than the gas heater, but our weather temperatures become a significant factor in how we figure all of that. Next page. This is our current situation with the zero depth walk-in for the pool. Um, you know, if you're three, this monstrosity is great. If you're a grandma, it stinks. I actually had to climb up through the tunnel to get the kid out of it. Um, I, it's not comfortable for me. We can't see through it, around it, or into it, which makes it extremely difficult for my staff to guard. Um, the big kids like to hide in it. They climb up into the top part and they hide, they play ball tag out of it, which means they're constantly running over the little kids that are in the zero depth, which is what the zero depth is designed for. Next page. So I've been talking with Vortex about some options that we can use to replace that, which would be much more toddler friendly. Uh, I have five options here. There are obviously other options. The price is very differently from 2700 to 15000 But part of it is going to really depend on what the piping in the pool deck looks like. 
once we can drain part of the water off and get into it. And Jacob Sabayan is willing to work with us on that. Uh, the biggest issue we found is the pilings that hold up the castle are part of the concrete on the pole deck. So some of it comes down to what's gonna happen when we take those out and what does the water source look like that's underneath? Because right now, uh, Matt, can you go back one? That entire slide function, which has uh, a shower, slides, things like that, it's all fed by a pump that hooks to something on the deck and then feeds out to all the different water features. So until we can take that pump out or at least disconnect it, we're not 100% sure what our feed source is as far as gallons per minute and what it would support. But getting rid of that allows us to be able to place a lifeguard sitting in, because the zero depth is shaped like this, I can put a lifeguard right at the beginning where the zero depth is and they will be able to see the entire shallow end. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I have a lifeguard that's constantly walking around and they, they're consistently missing one portion of that. So that's, that's part of it. Um, so we have a lot of work to do with what we do with that. Okay, next slide. The bane of my existence as far as the pool coals, this is where we failed our safety inspection, which is actually the next page. Our chemical storage rooms are not to code. There is no louver in the doors. The fans are corroded. They've been replaced numerous times with duplicate fans, um, which continually get corroded based on the chemical content of the air that's coming out of them and the lack of air flowing through the doors. Uh, I am working with Alcon and uh, Stan, Stan, yeah. Stanion. Basically, we're trying to determine the best option for us. It probably needs to be an enclosed motor fan and it needs to be made out of plastic because they would be chemical resistant, UV resistant, um, and they'll hold up for 10 to 15 years. Whereas if we replace with an identical fan, We'll be replacing every season and they're costing us about $600 a piece. Replacing with a, a plastic made fan, they're running $1,500 to roughly $2,200, but they're lasting 10 years. So that's obviously saving us a ton of money as far as that goes. And if you look at the pictures, uh, I don't know if you need to expand it. You can see on the rooftop, the uh, in the top left picture, the red that's coming down the roof is the acid room, which is deteriorating the shingles up there. The door that would be the bottom left, uh, the entire handle, shin, uh, hinges, everything completely corroded. The bottom right is a picture of the hydrant. It's in that room, it's completely corroded. If we try to attach anything to that to attempt to clean out the room, it will fall out on the floor in little tiny pieces. And you can see the doors. Uh, I have had them propped open all summer, which has made it a little bit better as far as the chemical fumes go for dealing it with it from you know like a hazmat safety aspect. But there's no louvers in the doors. Uh, the building center, next page, just shows where we failed our inspection. We don't have the correct ventilation. Next page. That is the quote from the building center for getting us the uh, steel edge doors with the louver kit. We're looking at about 1356 to replace those. I would need to ask the city guys to help cut out the doors to put the louvers in, but then we would be able to pull outside air because the outside doors to the mechanical room where both chemical rooms are are louvered so there's an the ability to draw clean air through which both chemical rooms have tubes that come down because the air needs to be pulled from the floor all the way up right now with the, the doors not being louvered that's not an option for us louvering the doors makes it possible to be pulling fresh air through them which will eliminate the issue with chlorine gas, which is a huge danger for anyone going in there. I'm wearing a mask, I'm wearing gloves, I'm wearing boots. 
uh, acid is actually better than it has been in the past because I use something called magic acid, which I love that I get to call it order magic acid. But uh, it's less corrosive, it has less fumes, but it's still going to corrode the room that it's in. So replacing the doors and putting the louvers in allows us to have the proper airflow to uh, make sure nothing is corroded and make sure whoever is in there is safe, even wearing the mask, because sometimes if chlorine gas gets too high, even with the mask, it's still not safe. Uh, the next one, two, three, four pages are technically calendars that would begin with next year. It shows us our typical ordering dates, when we begin filling, when we have to order food and drinks when swim team begins, when opening day is, some of the major groups that rent typically in a month, and we're already starting to fill that out. We've got table camp prairie view. The Methodist Church brings their youth group in in June. Uh, even fold in Tampa typically come in in July. Again, we have prairie view between their preschool and their school age group coming in. August, the last day that we're typically open to the public and it's not because this is what I would like to have but it's because we have a high school staff and, co and college staff they go back to school they start high school practices um I don't get lifeguards that aren't athletes I mean typically that's who becomes a lifeguard is an athlete most of the time like a track or a cross country or swimmer person and they're just not available I've had several people that have been upset because I wasn't open, but it's like, I don't have staff. This year I got really crunched um, because I didn't have a manager. Both my managers went back to school. When school started, I was working 12, sometimes 14 hours a day, which is not great for me. But we were also, because the pool is a community service, we were able to provide PE we were able to accommodate athletic teams. Uh, the lap swimmers, and all of you are familiar with Carla, she was extremely grateful. Um, your wife was extremely grateful, Matt. <laughs> Big swimmer. <laughs> um, but we were able to keep that and the teachers love that. And that's, that's one of those things that I'm like, okay, you know what, I'm never gonna make money. I apologize right now, I'm running a program that is always going to go in the hole. But I can provide service to our community. We had the low income group out of Marion County and we had parents as teachers in. We had the Hillsboro Public Library in. You know, I gave the teachers an opportunity to come over after school when they were first starting to just bench, relax, exercise, whatever they needed to do. And, and I can tell you right now that the patrons that utilize that are extremely grateful that we provide that option. And, and obviously I could limit a lot of things and say, we're not gonna do this, we're not gonna do this, we're not gonna do that. But I don't feel like that's, my, that's not my purpose in my job. As community engagement coordinator, my job is to provide opportunities to the community. And with the pool, I can do that. And I can service the school and I can service the college and I can service our mental health services in town. And so, yeah, I getting a little bit passionate about this, but that, that's what I'm supposed to do. Again, I apologize that I never make any money. Um, apparently- <laughs> Never has. Never have. No, will never has. No, I've never, never, I've never worked, and I actually have worked for an aquatic facility where I got a zero paycheck. Still there, still work for them. Uh, and there's a potential for next year into September with the Demarius Live Scholarship. We might do a triathlon um, the first Saturday after Labor Day. We're still kind of tentatively working through that, which would bump me another week. But I also can't get real vocal because for several years, my husband bumped it an entire month to run the Tabor swim team. But, you know, this, this is this one place in in our year that I see a majority of our population. Some of them I see every day, some of them I see sporadically, but I also know how grateful they are that we're open, that we're doing swim team, that we're doing swim lessons, that we have private lessons. 
you know, that we have rentals and, and it's a big deal. And our community, I will tell you right now, whether anyone else tells you this or not, they are extremely grateful that our pool is open. Okay. We do know because we had to shut it down during COVID. <laughs> well, um, I, I think that's what led Marcy to go, I'm done. Uh, but I mean, it just, it provides so much for so many people in our community. I mean, Danielle's kids swim. Ander swims mm -hmm. uh, until Angus and Kai distract him. <laughs> uh, your nieces swim. You know, your kids swim. It's just, it, it's, it's a gathering place for these kids. It's a place they can come to that's safe. And yes, sometimes I feel like we're, we're the city's childcare in the summer because I do have parents that literally pull in the parking lot at 12.50, drop their kids off and leave. And they come back at five o'clock or the kids walk home, but you know what, it's safe. And my staff is fantastic. And I think for most of you that have kids in the community, you know that my staff for the last two years has, has been a positive influence on kids in the community and just great role models. And so I, I don't want to see this go away, but I, I know we have to turn around and spend money that I don't necessarily have. So just to just to throw some things in there, uh, we have already we're starting to take care of all the safety things with yes. the stores. We've been talking about that all summer and trying to get the right stuff ordered and trying to get that. So that that's being taken care of. There is a chunk of money in the uh, Family Aquatic Center Fund, which we designated this year for uh, improvements. Specifically, we knew we had to do uh, resurfacing. So that was thirty seven thousand ish dollars. Uh, we had a hundred, I think a hundred, right around a hundred thousand, maybe a little bit more that we set aside this year or earmarked this year for those kind of improvements. So if there are things like the, um, what do we even call that thing? The castle? What do you call it? The, you want my no, let's, <laughs> <laughs> the thing there that we talked about. Let's just call it the thing. The structure, right? Uh, you know, if that's what needs to happen, if it makes it safer, improves the improves the thing, you know, we, we have opportunities to do that. There is some funding that can do that. Um, you know, obviously, if it goes over a certain, we don't know what we're going to find when we get in there. That's no, the other problem. That's so, the biggest issue. You know, it could be a it could be a three thousand dollars thing, or it could be a fifteen thousand dollars thing. We don't know. Um, and and honestly, um, of the features of the five that I had up there. The one I'm most interested in is $6,140. It's triangle shaped. It looks kind of like a pyramid. It has shells and fish and things on it and kids can spin it and change the direction that water comes off. And it sits about this tall. So to me, that's the most toddler friendly thing that we have. We still have the boat slide so that they would have the slide. But to me, that's kind of the thing that offers some tactile experience for smaller kids in the water and gives us something that we can guard around without having a loss of vision. And I, I about choked when they told me how much some of this stuff costs. <laughs> I, I don't know why, you know, a jellyfish that looks like this and spits water on you costs $15,000. But, and I did go through Vortex, who has provided our splash pad equipment, because I felt like we already had a connection. Um, there might be a price difference in the long run, um, because we've already purchased from them, but this is just the rough cost currently. When we purchased the spray park equipment, we did a lot of research about that. They use a lot of stainless steel fixtures, which last longer, so that's kind of, the, you do pay a little more, but ultimately last. It seems like yeah, they have a much longer life life expectancy than some of the other companies I tried to contact. And let me just tell you that splash pad features, if you Google them and look, there are no prices on the internet. You spend a long time on hold and try a lot of numbers to get somebody to answer you. And Vortex was the only one that I was actually able to 
like verbally connect with. Any other questions for Kara? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. You're welcome. I have to go make dino nuggets now. <laughs> Good yes. presentation. Thank you. Thank no, you. Here's your jump. Huh? Does that mean I got an A? Yes, you got an A. <laughs> it always makes me feel better. You know that. Uh, you guys have my email. So if you have any questions going forward as I continue to research with this, please email me. And yep. I will do my best to keep Matt up to date so that you can keep you guys up to date with where our costs are. Okay, we now have uh, an executive session uh, on the agenda for matters uh, pertaining to attorney client privilege. Mr. Siles, uh, yeah, we just need a, a 10 minutes, no, 10 minutes uh, to talk a little bit about attorney client privilege before we move into some of the business items. Okay, do you does anybody have the uh, Motion in front of them. Are you prepared to uh, yes. go for it? I move that the city council recess into executive session for the purpose of consultation with the city attorney for matters privileged pursuant to KSA 75-4319B2 for a period of 10 minutes. Executive session will include the city administrator and the city attorney. The open meeting will resume at 731. 731. Anybody uh, questions regarding that? Thirty-one. Is there a second? Oh, it's like a second. It's based on this time. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, that clock is fast. That clock's a little. Yeah. yeah. So who who who? I'll make the second. Buys. Councilman buys seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. The motion carries. We are now in executive session. Okay, we're back in open session for the record. Uh, let the record state there was no action taken during executive session. And uh, so we will now move into agenda item G, which is our business items. First item up is resolution 2022-12, setting a public hearing for 101 South Main, Mr. Stiles. Okay. So this is... Uh, similar to the ones we've been doing, setting a public hearing uh, for the owner record there uh, with regard to the 101 South Main building. Uh, it works through the same process. You've, we've had a, a, a report from public public officer um, on this building and, and it's obviously we've had some history with it going through municipal court. So uh, we're gonna set a public hearing or this, this resolution would set a public hearing uh, for the 15th of November, uh, and then we would be able to potentially take action further from there, according to the process. Any questions? Any other comments as this is uh, hearing none, we will call the question. Uh, does somebody care to make a motion to adopt resolution 2022-12, setting a public hearing for 101 South Main on the date being November 15th? November 15th. I'll make that motion. Councilman Lowen moves. Is there a second? Second. Councilman Driggers seconds. We'll poll the council. Councilman By. Yes. Councilman Lowen. Yes. Councilman Driggers. Yes. Resolution 2022-12 is hereby adopted, uh, setting a public hearing for November 15th for the property uh, at 101 South Main. 
We'll now move on to our second resolution, which is resolution 2022-13, setting a public hearing for 122 West Grand, Mr. Stiles. Sir, so this is a similar type situation. Obviously, we've been doing a lot of code enforcement, um, property maintenance things. So you have the report from Doug Dick, our code enforcement officer regarding the property at 122, 122 West Grand. Uh, this is a commercial structure. Uh, there's exterior wall damage. Uh, structure has been neglected, dilapidated, unsecured, uh, creates a nuisance. You can kind of see from the pictures, there's holes in the back of the building. Uh, I would say that the trees uh, that are shown in the, in the original pictures have been cut down. They cut those down, so that that is an improvement, but it still doesn't uh, correct the structure being in disrepair and lack of maintenance and deterioration. So uh, what we are recommending then is to um, approve or adopt, excuse me, resolution two, uh, 2022-13 and set a public hearing for November 15th. Um, we did a title search on this like we do with all these. It's with Peggy L. Watson Living Trust. Uh, all taxes are current on the building. And so it's uh, just a matter of uh, you know, meeting these regulations. So we are asking for uh, adoption of the resolution. Any questions? Everyone aware of where this structure is located? Next to Dale's. Mm -hmm. It's parking in. Okay. <laughs> you said you, you contacted the owner. Yeah, the owner has been contacted. They received multiple calls from uh, Doug okay. about this. So they are aware. Okay. Are they the same people that own that corner building? That I think it's like a shed that sits on ash. No, it's a, it's a different, this is a different. It's a different owner. Okay. They do have a common wall. Okay. Or shared wall. Any further questions? Hearing none, I'd accept a motion to adopt resolution 2022-13, setting a public hearing for 122 West Grand Street on November 15th, 2022. I'll make that motion. Councilman By moves. Is there a second? Second. Councilman Triggers seconds, excuse me. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll poll the council. Councilman Driggers. Yes. Councilman Lowen. Yes. Councilman By. Yes. Resolution 2022-13 is hereby adopted and the hearing is set for November 15th. We now have a proclamation for uh, recognizing Public Power Week for the week of October 2nd through the 8th, Mr. Stiles. Thank you, sir. So this is the uh, same resolution we've done the last few years. Public Power Week is, is kind of a fun week where we celebrate uh, all the benefits of public owned utilities. Uh, it's, it's a national thing. Uh, we do it through KPP Energy. Uh, it's part of our public relations, you know, public, public, public campaign to, to help promote the, the the importance of maintaining public utilities. And so uh, the resolution acknowledges that and says, hey, we should celebrate our public utilities uh, with the other 2000 public power systems in, uh, in, in the country and you know, celebrate public power. And I would say that I, I didn't send it out because we're still working on it, but we do have a list of events that we are planning to do on public power week. So uh, that week on Monday, we have a coloring contest at the second grade. Very excited about that. Uh, first, second, third prize is there. We're gonna be doing a picture of staff. We all have public power t-shirts. And so we're gonna have a big picture with that. Uh, we're also doing a food drive that week. So there's gonna be a whole food drive that week. There's also gonna be a drawing component to that, which will happen on Friday. Uh, Brooke Keller, Carroll, excuse me, uh, marketing director for KPP Energy is gonna be at the senior government class, actually. She, we're bringing her in to talk with the high school government class. Uh, the mayor and myself have done that already, and Stacy Jansen with the uh, Entrepreneurship Center also did that. So they're they're working on their senior projects right now. Uh, and then I think Tina Spencer, actually, the county clerk, is going to come talk to as well. Uh, so Brooke's going to come and talk about public utilities during that week, which is very exciting. I'm always happy to have Brooke in the in the community. Uh, we're going to have a customer appreciation day at City Hall, and so we're getting cookies from Mama C's. We're going to have refreshments, coffee, lemonade. Uh, just anyone from the anyone from the public can come in, and we're just thankful that you're here, and you know, talk to you about whatever you want to talk about. We just want to show a little appreciation.
very exciting. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and then we're going to do that on, on Wednesday and Thursday, which will be fun. Uh, and then there's going to be a middle school contest on Thursday. Uh, we're, I'm, I'm not, we don't think we've got this completely finalized, but it's sort of like a, a miniature essay contest. Uh, what would a day without power be like? And for a middle school kid, I cannot imagine what kind of hell that would be. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to that too. I think that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, and then on Friday, we're having a staff lunch, uh, KPP energy pays for uh, staff lunch. And that's a, a recognition thing there. And then we're also gonna be doing a drawing for $25 off the December bill from the community food drive. So if you donated to the community food drive, we're gonna be drawing one lucky winner to receive a $25 um, credit there. So we're also going to be looking for videos from public officials to support public or officials, I guess, not necessarily public officials, but officials, community members too, maybe, uh, in support of public power. And I know the mayor has already said he would do one. So that's one. I'm looking for three. So if anyone wants to jump in there, be happy to do that. We're going to be all over social media. We're going to have a good time with it. It's going to be a fun, fun week. We always have a, a good time with it. And sometimes that week, uh, I think two years ago, it was freezing cold. Uh, and last year it was like a hundred degrees. So I don't know what to expect, but we're going to have a lot of fun, uh, especially looking forward to the, the kids, kids events this year. So, but it all kind of starts with this, sir. So we're looking for, uh, approval of this, this, um, I guess it's a proclamation. Yes. So, uh, I will tell you that, uh, uh, Matt and I attended the, uh, KPP, uh, energy, uh, annual summit or what they just, it's now just conference. Yeah. It's just the 2022 conference that was referred to this year. And uh, what we saw was last year's Public Power Week KPP Energy member winner, which was the city of Augusta, uh, prepared and, and, and built a wonderful traveling trophy that is about Stanley Cup size. It's huge. Massive. And uh, so, uh, I will say that uh, Matt and the and the city team are determined to have that trophy uh, spend a year in Hillsboro. So it is. Uh, it was. It was a pretty cool thing that that yeah. uh, Augusta did. And and uh, and so there's. We're starting to generate a lot of uh, a lot of excitement amongst the membership of KPP in this in this contest. So uh, I'm excited about it, and uh, I know Matt and Danielle and the rest of our team have. I've got a lot planned, so I appreciate that. Any other questions regarding the uh, proclamation? Hearing none, I'd accept a motion to approve the proclamation recognizing Public Power Week and authorize the mayor to sign. Moved. Councilman Driggers moves. Is there a second? Second. Councilman By seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We now have. Uh, Hillsboro Ford invoices totaling $276.20, Mr. Stiles. Uh, I'm not seeing it in my packet. That's not in there. It's not in there. Oh, so let me pull it up real quick so that we can have a look at it. Uh, I believe we had three oil changes in here. Not on my list. That might be one. So I had a little technical issue where I accidentally deleted uh, some things when I was putting this together on Sunday. Uh, I think I have accidentally deleted that, but I can tell you that we have three oil changes totaling the total amount, which was the $276.20. If you'd like to, you can defer that if you want to. I can get that later. Um, What's your pleasure, gentlemen? Uh, I can so copy it over to that file here and oh, okay. have it up. If you're contributing to that. Daniel, I accidentally deleted all Daniel's files when we did this. Um, I don't know how I did it. So, okay. There it is. Take a look at that. Here we go. I believe that's the right one. I'm sorry, that's, that's, uh, that's not, well, maybe we will wait until I was going the most. That's the most recent one, I believe, because we had a. I don't believe we need to, uh, we need to have it in front of us to make this decision, but if, unless somebody objects. So 
hearing no objections, I'd, I'd, uh, I would uh, accept a motion to approve Hillsborough Ford invoices totaling $276.20 for payment. I so move. Councilman Lowen moves. Is there a second? Second. Councilman Driggers seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those abstaining? Abstain. And uh, I'm told that since we have a quorum and, and uh, that, that passes with a uh, two, two zero vote. All right, now we have a discussion item and Mr. Stiles, you prepared some information regarding the community plaza budget. Right, thank you, sir. So uh, as of September 12th, we've kind of pulled all the things we've spent here. Um, so as of right now, we've spent 195,000 on the project, uh, which also includes all the work on the street too. So it's not just the community plaza per se. Uh, includes all the water main repair there. Uh, we know we have some concrete left. I did some estimates on the remaining expenditures. Uh, the, we made one payment to votes on the restroom and they're working on getting that finished up. Um, I did a few estimates landscaping. I, I put a number in there. I think that's actually pretty high uh, from what we're going to end up doing. But I think there's an estimated 221,523 sort of remaining out there. Uh, we have received donations of 164591 uh, to offset some of that. So the total city cost at the end of the day when we're projected out, I think it's going to be about $252,253.02. Uh, where we're going to pay for that is basically we're going to use the ARPA money that we got from the federal government, which went into our CIP. Uh, that's where we've been paying most of these expenditures from. And so uh, we're actually federal government's going to be paying for it through through the ARPA money. Uh, there's still a remaining balance in there of over 300000 so it, there's more than enough sufficient to, to cover that, plus everything else we've done in the CIP this year. So, okay. And we broke it out kind of by category of stuff there. So there's kind of you know, sewer, water street, engineering, uh, some equipment stuff that we've had to buy. That's, that's basically just the actual spray park equipment. <laughs> Thanks for pulling that together. Yeah, yeah, that's really helpful. Any other questions or comments regarding the information? ETA on when that- Yeah, thing. good question. I've been asked, asked that a couple we've, of set, we've set a, a hard due date at the 21st of October. Okay. Um, I'm 100% confident we can get there. Uh, we're going to push votes a little bit. That's mm -hmm. kind of where some of the hang up has been. Okay. Um, I haven't yeah. seen them out there for a while. They haven't been out there for a while. They need to get, get to work on laying the brick because part of their work impacts some of the stuff we have to do because some of the controls go in that building. So, mm -hmm. um, but 21st of October is what we're. Okay. I know. So be here quick. We we're actually doing a port tomorrow on the street. I think another one hopefully yet this week. So yeah. we're. We're on track, I think, to do that. Okay, any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Stiles. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. We now uh, move into city administrator's report. Uh, yeah, first thing I wanna just talk about, uh, Al Votes, Al Votes uh, passed away on the 12th of September at a heart attack. Uh, the mayor and I went to the funeral today at New Spring Church, it was, it was well attended. Uh, Al was very well known and uh, sadly missed. It's only 62 at the time of his passing. So, um, of course, Al and, and Rich Oster are, are the two people with Our Town Development, which we've contracted and, and done a lot of, we're doing a lot of active projects with. So, uh, we're intending on finishing those. And we talked a little bit with Rich today. And I think he, he was in agreement with that. And, you know, I think he wants to honor Al's memory because Al did have a lot of ideas and a lot of input in this and so uh, we're looking forward to finishing those things and then you know we're going to evaluate after that and see what the future looks like so i'm not sure what what rich wants to do without al there so uh but it was it's very sad very sad um you know it's always tough but uh, it's good funeral good funeral and um, a lot of people attended so uh, arts and crafts that went pretty well, I think. Uh, it had no major incidents, I should say. Um, that, that's my banner for pretty well. Uh, attendance, we you know, obviously don't take attendance, there's no gate or anything we can catch people in, but 
uh, from everybody I talked to, the crowd was bigger than it was last year. So that's kind of a measuring stick we use. It's, it's bigger than last year. Um, and I think everybody I've talked to has had reported pretty good, pretty good participation, pretty good sales. You know, we had a lot, we have a lot of community members to do fundraisers during that time. Everybody's been pretty positive about that. Um, so I think that's a good sign, a good sign for the health of the, of the festival as it kind of moves forward. COVID really kind of kicked the wind out of a lot of things. And um, I'm, I'm happy to see that it is doing well this year. So uh, electrical matters, you know, the mayor mentioned the fall conference there. So you know, one of the things we talked about with escalating prices, which is really, it's hard to ignore. Uh, the cost of energy has gone up, uh, primarily the cost of natural gas, which is where a, a healthy chunk of our, of our energy comes from or is generated from. So, um, you know, you can kind of see how that's impacting us. And the direct impact for us is the uh, August bill for KPP, which I attached on there, 327,000. Um, but the energy cost adjustment there was uh, over a cent per kilowatt hour, which is about 10% of the total bill when you start looking at how that works out. Uh, so those increasing costs are really have impacted our financial position. We've got a low, we, we always carry a fairly low fund balance, lower than I would like in there and lower than what's prescribed by KPP. Uh, but right now it's in that 114,000. And so that's pretty low. I mean, we need to be thinking about that. Uh, you know, we've set financial goals for the utility. We're going to be talking about a rate study because that is, they're finishing it up right now at KPP. So you know, when you look at the analysis report they have and the metrics that they put out there, um, you know, we used to be called a scorecard, uh, changed that. And that they're really, they target our fund balance to be about 900,000, which, you know, that's, that's a healthy fund balance uh, for that type of utility. So just wanted to put it out there. I mean, there, I don't think there's any need to run around panicking at this point, but we're definitely going to have to look at that. We may want to look at some other options too. Uh, you know, we have the ability to do an ECA in our ordinance. We've never done that. Um, that energy cost adjustment that can go up and down depending on the cost of power. Never done it, uh, but it, it is written into the ordinance. Um, so that's something maybe we'll look at. I don't know. I'm not sure what the rate study is going to come back with. Uh, and it may be something we want to consider. You know, it's pretty typical to divide residential and con commercial customers up um, and have kind of two different rate structures. Uh, we have a really just a flat rate trade. It's the same for everybody. It doesn't matter who you are or want you. So those are some options to put that out there. Like I say, no need to run around panicking yet, but uh, we're, we're going to need to make some adjustment here. So if I could add the, the, the really the challenge for, uh, for not just Hillsboro, not just the Kansas power pool, not just the state of Kansas, but the, uh, but the entire nation is what is referred to as load following generation. And of course you hear a lot of talk about uh, renewables, wind, energy, hydro, nuclear is also considered renewable. But uh, those, those uh, with the exception of, of nuclear there, the, the, uh, the rest of them are not load following. I mean, they generate when the wind blows and when the sun shines. And uh, when the water flows, and so uh, if those things aren't happening, they're not generating, and that doesn't mean that we don't need the power. So, as you are, uh, uh, I think uh, most of you are aware, Blake may not be, but uh, the the KP, KPP Energy is is pursuing uh, the addition of of uh, load following generation uh, through uh, Wartzilla generators that are that would be built in Europe and brought over and installed in the Winfield, Kansas area. And this project would, would generate uh, approximately 53 megawatts of generation and add that into the KPP mix, which would more than make up for the Jeffrey Energy Center, which is our coal contract, which is, which is going out next year. So we'll be done with the, with the coal contract at that point. So, there's a cost obviously associated with, with the coal generation that, uh, that we're incurring now as well, that hope that will be gone yeah. in a year. So that will help. But uh, right now the price of natural gas mm -hmm. and a lot of that is due to the war in Ukraine and the cost, you know, the, the, the demand for natural gas is, uh, is caused the, the prices to be 
at record record highs. I mean, uh, excluding winter storm Uri, mm. I should say. So we're operating at highs that hadn't been seen for quite some time. So, mm -hmm. you know, until we uh, until we, you know, can get and and we listen to the uh, uh, Lanny. Uh, I think it's Lanny's last name. No, 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 that's the. Anyway, the guy that's head of, head of the uh, Southwest Power Pool, and uh, their their uh, interconnect queue is backlogged for several years, and and our request went in in 2020, and he reported that he thought that we would have an answer by the end of next year, so we're not going to be able to place an order for these this generation until we get that approval, which doesn't look like it's going to happen until the end of next year. So that's a challenge. <clears throat> These are the generators that Larry. That's correct. Saw yep. yep. Brought back pictures then. Yep. <clears throat> yep. And uh, since since that trip, they have uh, they have uh, changed the connection request to ask that these be dual fuel powered, so they they can be operated on either natural gas or diesel fuel, and potentially other fuel, yeah. other liquid fuels as well. <clears throat> So, it's a good synopsis. It's a challenge, I guess. That's it is. A, it's a challenge. It's a huge challenge. And uh, you know, so we've got to, uh, we've got to kind of figure a way, to find a way through. I mean, it's it's great that we can have renewable mm -hmm. energy generation, and and we do get a lot of wind, but we don't always get it when we need it. So, and it also produces a lot of natural gas. Mm -hmm. And it is the cleanest burning fuel that there is. Some people don't see it that way. This is another pollutant. Yeah, it's it's clean. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Styles. Uh, yeah, uh, seed grant. So I'm putting together a seed grant on kind of behalf of the county at this point. Uh, seed grant is through the Department of Commerce, and they're giving they're giving out one per county. And so as we were putting it together, we realized that there were probably three or four different people looking at this grant because there's a real specific carve out for rural grocery stores. Um, and so we went out and we, we had one, the Peabody market reached out to us through our network Kansas because we provide uh, e-community stuff through them. And they were asking for some assistance with that. So I was like, okay, well, I can, I can help you with that. And then, then we went and talked to Gospel and they needed something too. And then we went and talked to Tampa and they needed something too. And I talked to to Carlson's over in Marion the other day uh, right after the county commission meeting. And so we're kind of grouping them all together. Uh, originally started with Dale needing some, Dale's supermarket needing some help with flooring. And now it's it's kind of grown to this other thing where we're now we're collaborating with everybody in the county, which is great. Happy to help and do that. Uh, it's a $50,000 maximum grant, one per county with a 10% match. Uh, and I don't think we're having any problems getting the 10% match because what ends up happening with this, uh, the way it's structured, the city would be the applicant, but there would be subrecipients for every one of those places. And so we don't really have to worry about chasing Peabody Market around or, or the Gospel Grocery Store to make sure they did what they were supposed to do. The Department of Commerce will do that. We just have to be the applicant. So uh, we're putting that together. We're partnering. It's a great opportunity. Went and talked to the County Commission on Monday about it, and they're more than willing to give us a letter of support, especially if there's no financial commitment. So they were really happy about that. So uh so it's a 10 percent match from each business yeah for each part of the business but they, they look at it overall and you get you get extra points if you're doing a collaborative project which we should do really well with that and then uh 10 percent match is the minimum if there's more you're more competitive uh and some of these folks are are willing to put in more than just the 10 percent. so i think on when you start adding it all up we'll actually be closer to like a 25 or 30 percent match so should be should be pretty competitive. I'm looking forward to putting that one in. That'll be due at the end of the month. So it's another thing with the Department of Commerce to give you like 25 days. That's all you got to do this grant. So working on that, we'll get it finished up and sent in. Hopefully, be successful with that, and everybody can get something uh, out of that. Treasurer's reports attached there for you. August, uh, September. Uh, I'm going to be rolling out a new dashboard style report. I'm kind of tinkering with that right now. So. Uh, you'll still get the treasurer's report, which has all the data that the email puts together, and then we we go through together and approve. Um, we kind of see everything on there. I won't spend a ton of time looking at it unless you have specific questions. Um, 
At our October 4th meeting, we're going to have our annual service award. We've got six people uh, celebrating milestone anniversaries this year with us. So we're excited to have that. Uh, I was going to be at a CDBG workshop tomorrow, but that ended up, I ended up getting out of that and doing something else. So I uh, won't be there, but our, our grant writers will be in attendance for that. That's for the uh, child care CDBG application we're putting in. And then I will be off on Thursday on a vacation day. And I've got two follow-ups from last meeting. Uh, the utility pole over on Adams that's tilted. It's a laminated pole and there was some concern about the tilt. Uh, talked with Westar and I'm still trying to get it in writing from them, but uh, it's engineered to do that. Uh, the way they've tilted it is designed to hold the load uh, that they're going to be pulling through there on the conductor. Uh, so it's it's supposed to do that. That's not something that they've overlooked. Uh, it's actually supposed to be they had tilted a little bit of a lean to it. Um, they do that in order to to compensate for the, the weight and the load that's going through there. So, uh, and then the EV charger in the back here, we have ordered, we have on order timers for that and we're working on some signage too. So uh, the goal there is to have it for visitors. And so what we're gonna do is have the timer, it'll kick off at a certain hour. We have to set that um, so that you can only charge basically during the day. And then uh, the signage will kind of talked about, welcome to Hillsborough, thanks for visiting with us. And then also, uh, we're hoping to be able to put our, our city maps in there. We have city maps, as CBB does. It has all the businesses on it. So uh, it's supposed to be geared toward that. And so that's what kind of what we did. So that's everything I had, sir. Okay. Any questions? Um, hearing none, we are now at our second uh, public comment opportunity. And I would like to, uh, I don't see any other, unless... Uh, Ms. Smith would like to comment. Uh, I don't see anybody online. So uh, if I could, I'd like to finish the email I received from Mr. Zeller. And this, uh, this is his second part of his uh, comments. He said, on a side note to this house, I would like to know what the plan is for South Birch Street as for the condition of the road and curbing. The curbing has been an eyesore for some time now, and the road has started to get really bad this year. B Street is just as bad, if not worse. Any ideas as to the plan on this street? I know when the water line project was going on for Grand Street, there was a little discussion as to replacing the water line on South Birch at some point in time. Getting the street curbing and water line projects together would be a great idea so as not to tear up a new street to install water lines later. And that again was from Mr. Zeller and I believe his address is 108, 108 South Birch. So, um, and and to his uh, uh, to his comment, I would say obviously we know that money is an issue. Obviously, you know, in terms of budgets and, and streets, but uh, uh, we have asked, and and I believe it's underway. And if it's not, we need to find out where we're we're at with that. But I believe. Darren Newfelt with EBH has it on his plate to provide us a prioritized list of street repairs that, that we think need to be made. And, and certainly that's something we're gonna to have to take a look at. Uh, I think it bears, uh, it bears a comment that, you know, not every street can be replaced, but maybe there's some repairs and uh, albeit it's hard to know when to start and stop once you start repairing a street. I will, uh, I will comment from my own personal observation that uh, I'm trying to think of the street uh, between in, it's just in front of the high school that uh, goes for a block there towards the Jefferson ball field. I can't think of Madison. the name. Madison. There, the city crews did repair work to that street and I thought did a pretty admirable job with the limited resources that they had to, to make it you know, improve the significantly improve, you know, it, it, even though it's still not what it should be. I mean, I'm not saying that, but so, you know, I'm thinking that uh, if we haven't seen that list, we need to get on top of Mr. Newfeld and EBH and, mm -hmm. and encourage them to get that done. Yeah, they're actively working. Okay, is it any other uh, comments on that? If not, we'll move to council co comments. Councilman Driggers. That's right. Councilman Lowen. Not tonight. Thank you. Councilman Bai. Okay. Is there any other business that needs to come before the council? 
Hearing none, I declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.